I call it a spread. I don't know what kind of uh, gun it is, but it, it was like a prrr, like that. And all of a sudden, the girl next to me, where my daughter was standing with her husband, was shot in the mouth. Our children witnessed it. She was on the ground, bleeding from her mouth, all over her shoulder. Heart-wrenching accounts there as we follow this breaking news tonight. The parade to celebrate the Kansas City Chiefs Super Bowl win turned to chaos after a mass shooting there. At least one person has been killed and more than 20 people have been shot, including children. I'm Gotti Schwartz. This is Stay Tuned Now. Kansas City police say three people are now in custody and they have confirmed that one person they are actually holding was brought down by fans at that rally. You might have already seen that heroic act possibly caught on camera. This is it right there. A man seen running through the crowd only to be tackled by the people around him. Oh, oh we tackled him. Yeah. When, when we tackled him, the gun came out. Now you see the police there, they were able to get there, jump on top of that man shortly after. One woman claimed her dad helped bring that hooded man down, recording all of it from just a few feet away. Police also seen uh, jumping over fences and pushing through crowds to try to get to the city's famed Union Station where more gunshots were heard. Now, this is still an ongoing investigation, but here's what we know so far. At least 22 people were shot. Several are in critical condition. Again, three people are in custody, and we don't have any names or information about the shooters just yet, but police are saying that this shooting appears to be criminal in nature and not terrorism. And here's what some of the witnesses said about those terrifying moments. Yeah, one we saw one of the shooters. He had a brown jacket on, and he was, uh, he was ready. He was real young, probably looked yeah, about, about 16 young. or 17 years old. Mm -hmm. um, they were really young. Yeah. Uh, men and women were gathering their children. It was so many children just having to be, like, picked up real fast. One of um, my children's father's sister, um, her daughter, ended up breaking her leg. Knew then it was going to be serious, and people just, like, when the crowd shifted and started running, all we could think about was protecting our children because they were going to get trampled on while they, we were trying to stay safe. I'm never bringing my kids to another place like this again. I don't, it, they ruined it for us because it's the second time we've came to something big event like this and there was a shooting. So it's just not safe anymore wherever you go at all. I mean, there's too many people, too many children for them to just spread and guns like that. You know what I mean? Go to find God because you're putting everyone's life in jeopardy, including your own, by doing something so stupid and so self selfish. It, it's just, you don't think about other people. You're not thinking about other people at all. We were down over really close to the situation. Um, we saw people starting to jump over the gates and then um, they were telling us to run but then they said active shooter and then so we just dropped down to the ground my daughter tried to climb on top of me to protect me and I tried to just hold her so nothing would happen to her it was right after the shots were fired I didn't know if he was dead I didn't know if he was injured I had no idea like, it was probably the worst feeling I've ever felt We've also been hearing from some of the players from the Kansas City Chiefs, including quarterback Patrick Mahomes. None of the players or coaches or staff were hurt in the gunfire. And NBC News correspondent Jesse Kirsch joins us now from Kansas City. Jesse, it's good to see you safe, my friend. Uh, the police chief said this happened at the end of the parade. You were there covering that for us. Uh, what did you see from where you were? And, and I know I can see almost the scene behind you. You're up elevated. Can you walk us through where everything happened? Yeah, and Gotti, it's getting dark out, so it might be hard to see some of this, but I know they've lit up the train station behind me. So what was going on was we were at the end of a large event, and it was really like any other large event, a sporting event, a concert. It's that time where you start getting people who are trickling out, right? It's not the full exodus, but people are starting to leave uh, and they're moving at a, a leisurely pace. And when you have thousands of people here, you're not going anywhere fast. And so we see all these people broadly who are just starting to move away and we're watching from uh, on top of this hill at, uh, near a museum. And we're looking down at the scene and I noticed that there were dozens of people in their chief's red gear who appeared to be running. And that didn't make sense to me because, again, we are at a place where there's so many people, you're not getting anywhere faster by trying to move faster. So that struck me as strange. And our team started watching more closely, and we noticed what appeared to be police officers who were rushing in. And it looked like there were at least some of them jumping over barricades. And we also then looked up 
overhead. On the rooftop here, there were people with binoculars. And on a rooftop behind me, there was a long gun, a sniper team. And I saw someone from that sniper team running across the rooftop and then running back to the edge where the long gun was and the other member of that team was. And so clearly something was not right. The siren started wailing and everything devolved from there. And that wound up leading to be what we now know to have been a deadly shooting at what was supposed to be a party here, Gotti. There's tons of videos circulating online. I mean, in those moments of mayhem, it's hard to know what's happening. But now, as we can slow things down and see it, uh, have you been able to pinpoint exactly where people were taken down? And, and this video in particular of the bystanders stepping in to stop the gunman, uh, do you have any uh, information, any specifics on what happened there? Yeah, so police have been asked about it, and they had a little bit of an update tonight. So authorities say that they have three people that they've detained, and they're looking into the possibility that one of the people detained was the person seen on camera being tackled by bystanders. As for where this happened, Gotti, uh, they say it happened on the west side. That's over there. So for context, right in the middle, uh, under the main archways, the window archways of the train station, the historic Union Station, that's where the stage was. And off to the side, that's the general area where authorities say the shooting is said to have happened, Gotti. And police say that there were 800 officers there. As you mentioned, you had um, teams on the roofs, you had teams down in the crowd. Uh, they were expecting something like a million people, right? I know you spoke to the mayor yesterday about the preparations. Was this something that they, they were ready for? Yeah, so they were expecting around a million people, somewhere in that rough estimate, and that's based off of what they saw last year. A couple changes this time around. The weather was a lot better from what I understand from the mayor. We're talking about roughly 60 degrees earlier today. The sun was out. Great day to be outside in the middle of February. On top of that, there have been all this talk about Taylor Swift ahead of time. Would she be here supporting her boyfriend, Travis Kelsey, who was on the Chiefs? And so there was the added possibility of the Swifty effect, of fans coming here to see her on top of all of the Chiefs fans. So there's a potential that this could be even bigger than last year. The mayor said to me yesterday that they are prepared for any contingency. That was uh, in response to me specifically asking about uh, Taylor Swift uh, and potential conversations with her team. Uh, but he said they were prepared for any contingency. He said they prepared for months. And, of course, this was a celebration for back-to-back -back Super Bowl wins. They did this last year, and this was the third time they did this within the last five years. So this is not a new kind of event here for Kansas City. But at the same time, we're talking about a lot of people, roughly a million people, Gotti. That's about twice the population of the entire city of Kansas City, but we're talking about putting it in a relatively small area in the downtown along the parade route and right here where that rally was going on. Such a huge number. Jesse Kirsch, again, so glad you're safe. Thanks so much for joining us. And let's bring in NBC News enforcement analyst and retired ATF special agent in charge, Jim Cavanaugh. Uh, Jim, so good to see you. You join us now. Uh, according to the preliminary investigation, officials are saying that this shooting seems to be criminal in nature, not terrorism. And they seem to say that very quickly. So what does that tell you about what they know right now? Well, they're analyzing the overall event, and we can do some of that ourselves. You know, a terrorist attack, they'd likely strike the grandstands because the terrorists want theater. They want the whole world to see it because they want to strike fear in the whole world or their adversaries like in America or, you know, they, it's a show with, 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 with terrorists. Uh, this event happened when, the, uh, when the, the main part of the parade was over. People were dispersing. They were walking away. And uh, you, you saw the one person who was tackled with the brown jacket and the white hoodie. So the way it transpired, the, the timing of it in the event and the fact that they arrested two people, the first report said they had two guns. I'm not sure now if they have two or one. Uh, I do think, Gotti, there's a possibility here that we're dealing with a handgun with a Glock switch, commonly called the Glock switch. It's a device that fi fixes on a handgun, makes it a submachine gun. And somebody might have sprayed the crowd, uh, you know, shooting at someone else, but spraying bullets like a submachine gun. And those guns will shoot wildly uh, because they're hard to control, especially if you have one hand. So we, we might have something like that. It'll be interesting to see what we learn from the police. Uh, there's, this could be a grudge. It could be an ongoing gang rivalry. It could have been, you know, somebody else was involved in violence with some other group. That's what it looks like. Criminal, uh, criminal element 
in Kansas City somehow encountering each other or a robbery or something gone bad like that. Remember, when you have a million people there, there's a lot of those people that aren't really good citizens. A small percentage of the million, but enough to cause havoc. And, of course, they'll come with their guns in case they run into their rivals or, uh, you know, they're just criminals. They carry guns all the time. Illegal guns, uh, they do it all the time. So that's likely what we have. I'm sure Kansas City detectives have a lot more than that. And some of that will probably break tomorrow. And, Jim, I'm so glad you brought up the Glock switch. I've actually been hearing a lot about that. They just had a bust here in uh, L.A. just recently where there was a, a Glock switch that was uh, confiscated. And it, it sounded a lot like that. A lot of the video that we're seeing, we're still working on clearing. But is that just based on the, the rapid fire sound that you heard in some of those uh, those videos? Well, you have a witness who described that kind of rapid fire sound. You have 22 mm -hmm. people shot from a person who's probably not carrying a long gun. And mm -hmm. when, you, when you shoot a semi-automatic pistol, you know, the shots can be rapid, but people start to duck. They start to, to drop to the ground to lay down. If you shoot a submachine pistol, I mean, people don't even have time to duck. It will empty a 30-round magazine in one and a half seconds. So you don't even have time to react to the first shot before the 30th shot is out of the barrel. So I'm using the totality of the circumstances here, uh, witnesses describing it, the running, the placement, the criminal element, the probably not having a long gun, the number of people shot, uh, that it's just a possibility, Gotti. And those things are ubiquitous out here in the street. I mean, ATF agents are collecting those things by the barrel and police officers are encountering all the time. And, and you know, they're, they're not made by Glock. I want, it could, should clear that up mm -hmm. for the good corporate citizens of Glock. They don't want anything to do with them. Their guns are not illegal. Glock makes a good firearm. A lot of police use it. That's the street set slang for this automatic sear. Some of them come from Mexico. Some are 3D printed. You know, they're, they're illegally made. Just the possession of the switch without the gun is a federal right. felony. So just the switch. But it'll be interesting if, the, if, if we see what, what if that is play, comes to play uh, in this tomorrow or the next day. Jim Cavanaugh, thanks so much. We appreciate your expertise. We want to bring in now Manny Abarca. He was at the parade with his daughter when that shooting broke out. Manny, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, glad to see you're safe. I know this has been a, a tough, tough day for you. First off, uh, how are you and your daughter doing? What's going through your head right now? Uh, mixed emotions. My daughter is extremely resilient. Uh, she uh, reverted back to training, thankfully, from the Kansas City Public Schools. Uh, she knew what to do. Uh, she was more comforting than I uh, was helpful. So uh, I'm thankful for her, that bravery. Uh, it's just unfortunate that we're seeing this in Kansas City, but not unpredictable. Uh, okay, so I, just putting things into perspective, the first thing you said is your daughter reverted to training. A lot of people at home might be like, oh, she's an EMS uh, student or something. Your daughter is five years old, and the training Correct. you're talking about is the training that she gets at her public school. Is that right? Correct. And she was the one comforting you? She was the one that was extremely <sighs> calm. She had no problem being quiet. Uh, she even, in fact, said, I'm glad we're in the restroom. Uh, so she um, she knew what to do. And that is a sad state of society that we're, we're living in if our kindergartners are teaching grown adults what to do in an active situation like this. Uh, a sign of the times. Manny, I understand uh, you were with the team at some point. You were pretty close to the stage. Can you walk me through what you saw from your vantage point and what happened? Yeah, so we were about three rows back from the front of the stage. Uh, the county was a sponsor, so we were navigating in uh, to a transition point with uh, team members, with the coaches, with other legislators from the city, from the state. Uh, when we saw the rush of the crowd obviously reacting to uh, some situation, and it was a wave of fear that was coming towards us. And I picked up Camila. I ran into a nearby restaurant. I saw members of the Hunt family, Coach Reed and his family, uh, players uh, running towards the same direction. Uh, and I took her um, to a, a smaller bathroom and the, the bottom floor of the restaurant, and we hid. Uh, and we sat quietly as we hoped no one would come in and no one uh, would end our lives that day. <sighs> What was it like to go from this huge moment of celebration to be there with your daughter to to to? 
protecting her and fearing what could be outside that door. I mean, what do you tell your daughter after something like this? What, what are the conversations like tonight? I took a picture of her uh, as we ne eventually navigated back to Arrowhead uh, where she was dancing and with her shadow. She had not understood what had happened and we had to have that conversation with her. And she immediately asked, um, how are the people? How are the people that are hurt? And um, we do know them, they're family friends, unfortunately, um, one who is tragically lost. Um, but it, it is painful to have to have that conversation with your daughter about the state of our state and its access and ease to guns. And we're still waiting for official word on uh, the status of a lot of these victims, but can you, just based on, on what you know, was it families with their kids that seemed to be the ones that, that bore the bulk of the tragedy here? Yeah, it seems like it's um, one core family that many in Kansas City know very well, um, very well connected, and, and even uh, I think another elected official um, that has connections directly uh, with this family. And so uh, my heart goes out to them uh, this evening. Um, and I know uh, hearing directly from other members, uh, third third cousins basically of this family, that they're angry. And it's because of the access and ease to guns uh, that this situation happened, whether it was a long gun, a short gun, a small one, a fat one, it doesn't matter. In this state, we are the worst when it comes to gun policy. And Manny, again, we, we will wait for officials to, to notify next of kin, and, and we won't be releasing any information out of source. But, but I just I can't thank you enough for your uh, perspective and your daughter's resilience in this whole tragedy gives just a, a glimmer of hope for all of us. So thank her as well. She's there. <laughs> oh, there she is. Hi. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you guys Thank you. so much for, yeah, big hug to her. <laughs> Thanks again. Thank you. And don't go anywhere. We're just getting started on Capitol Hill. A new warning about a national security threat involving Russia and possibly space warfare. What we're learning about that unusual statement tonight, plus a dangerous TikTok trend is killing teens in San Francisco. We've got those details coming up. And a mystery at an aquarium is leaving scientists um, stumped, to say the least. How the heck did a stingray become pregnant when she's only been around sharks? It's all just ahead, so stay tuned. Hey there, welcome back. And here are some of the stories we're following out here in the West. The traffic came to a brief stop for several lanes of the Golden Gate Bridge earlier this morning. Pro-Palestinian protesters gathered there holding up signs demanding Israel to stop targeting Palestinians ahead of that planned ground assault in Rafah. Local police said things got pretty tense between protesters and drivers, but no one was hurt and no arrests were made. Maui police have identified a 76-year-old man as a new victim of those deadly Lahaina wildfires back in August. Police say that they were able to identify the man by comparing x-rays taken before and after his death, and that death toll now rising to 101. More than two-thirds of those deaths were people in their 60s or older, and at least two people are still missing. Check out these stunning aerials of mansions in Dana Point here in California. At least three multi-million dollar homes appear to be teetering on the edge of those cliffs after these back-to-back -back rainstorms we've had. And officials are saying no one has been evacuated and that the homes have no structural damage and are actually safe to live in. Forecasters are predicting more wet weather is on the way, so yikes. And coming up, a stingray named Charlotte. Well, Charlotte's pregnant. But the crazy thing is, a shark might be the dad. If you're thinking, how is that even possible? We're with you. We're going to have some questions coming up. But first, you got to see this. Nothing says happy Valentine's Day like teddy bears and roses. But some say one Peruvian woman got more than just hearts and flowers. Earlier today, Peruvian police dressed up as a teddy bear telegram deliverer to lure an alleged drug dealer out of her house. After seeing the teddy bear with gifts, the woman stepped outside to get them, which led to her arrest. The police say two women were found in the house with more than 15,000 portions of cocaine paste. And if you think that's crazy, this is not the first time Peru has used bait and switch. Just last year, officers up there or down there dressed up as Santa Claus to catch criminals. Talk about getting your heart broken.
Hey there, welcome back. And here are some of the headlines we're watching tonight. It's been more than 12 hours, and police in Washington, D.C. are still in this standoff with a person suspected of shooting three officers today. And that suspect is barricaded inside of a home in the southeast part of the city. And police say the officers were serving an arrest warrant for animal cruelty when they were shot. All three are expected to survive. And a Tennessee deputy was laid to rest after he was killed during a traffic stop last week. Now hundreds gathered to mourn the loss of Greg McCowan in Knoxville today. And police say he was shot by Kenneth DeHart, who led officers on a days-long manhunt before finally being arrested yesterday. The dash cam video has captured the moments a car flipped over on a highway in Massachusetts and barely missed an ambulance transporting a patient at that time. Now, of course, that ambulance pulls over to check to make sure everybody inside of that car was okay, and miraculously, no one was hurt. And Alaska Airlines flight attendants have voted to authorize a strike, which doesn't mean they are definitely going on strike, at least for now, but it will probably do so if negotiations with the airlines don't result in a deal. Now, according to the union, which represents flight attendants in Alaska, over 93% of the union voted, with 99% of them voting to authorize that strike. And Democrat Tom Suozzi won the New York special election to replace expelled Congressman George Santos. Suozzi beat Republican Mazi Pillup, and millions were poured into that high-profile race, which will play a major factor in the fight for control of Congress. And now to a very, very very unusual warning today from the chair of the House Intelligence Committee about a, quote, serious national security threat. Now, NBC is reporting it has something to do with Russia and its military capabilities in space. Now, the White House is also describing the situation as serious, but no one is telling us exactly what it is, and they're insisting that there are ways to, quote, contain the threat. Earlier today, NBC News spoke with several lawmakers who received top secret briefings on the nature of this threat, and every single one of them chose their words extremely carefully. Take a listen. I share the chairman's uh, view that uh, our hope is, is that the White House um, takes, this, takes this matter seriously. You know, this is a serious issue. There are many serious issues that we undertake all the time. Concern is serious. That's all I can say right now. Serious. Yes. Serious. And so is the push to declassify it. NBC's chief White House correspondent, Peter Alexander, has more. Tonight, President Biden facing calls to declassify details following a cryptic warning that there's a, quote, serious national security threat to the U.S. That ominous and highly unusual public message from the House Intelligence Committee chairman, Republican Mike Turner, saying the president needs to make that move so that Congress, the administration, and our allies can openly discuss the actions necessary to respond to this threat. Tonight, four sources with knowledge of the matter tell NBC News that threat refers to a Russian military capability, with two of those sources specifying it refers to Russia's military capabilities in space. We pressed the president's national security advisor you, about Turner's warning. Can you tell Americans that there's nothing they have to worry about right now in terms of what he describes as a national security threat? In a way, that question um, it is impossible to answer with a straight yes, right? Because Americans uh, understand that there are a range of threats and challenges in the world. I am confident that President Biden, in the decisions that he is taking, is going to ensure the security of the American people going forward. A top House Democrat is urging calm. There's really no cause for panic or alarm around this particular piece of intelligence. And tonight, this from the House Speaker. I want to assure the American people there is no need for public alarm. Steady hands are at the wheel. We're working on it. Two U.S. officials tell NBC News President Biden has been tracking the threat and directed his national security advisor to engage with top lawmakers with a meeting already set for tomorrow. The U.S. has long been concerned about Russia's missile and nuclear capabilities, as well as its anti-satellite weapons systems. Peter Alexander, thanks so much. Now, a lot of us have come to rely on Uber or Lyft for rides, especially when it comes to getting to and from the airport. But today, thousands of rideshare drivers drove straight to the picket line right in time for Valentine's Day. Drivers for Uber, Lyft, and DoorDash held a nationwide strike for two hours this afternoon, demanding higher wages and better treatment. 
The rallies were also held at 10 of the country's busiest airports, including Chicago, Miami, and NBC News correspondent Steve Romo has the latest from Newark Liberty International Airport in New Jersey. Yeah, Gotti, this is the rideshare hold lot outside of Newark Airport, and it's the site of the demonstration today because these organizers really wanted to illustrate just how desperate the situation can be here sometimes. They say often people sleep in their vehicles. They're out here uh, brushing their teeth, just waiting for hours at a time for that next fare because they're trying to earn a living wage. Now, the organizers we talked to also saying that they hope this can be sort of a shot across the bow, a warning shot, if you will, to these companies to let them know how serious they are about these demands, which include a living wage along with access to health care and more. Here's more of what the organizers and drivers had to say about today. Most of the drivers, you know, they have the, the perception as if, you know, it's a modern day slavery they're doing. But since they are caught up in this web, they don't know what to do. We're bleeding huh? right now. I only make like 80 bucks yesterday, all day working. Uh, Monday, $43 all day. How am I going to pay my rent? Now, we've also heard from Uber and Lyft. Both companies say they are working with their drivers. They're listening to them and trying to improve their experience. Uh, Uber also added that type, these protests of this type don't really even make an impact to them most of the time. They don't notice a dip in the drivers that are available. And they also say that it doesn't really seem to have an impact on prices. We'll have to wait and see if today that pans out as well. I also did want to mention that uh, we got the, the stocks information for today from Uber and Lyft closing. Uber closing up 15%. Lyft up 35%. Excuse that plane passing by. Uh, also important to point out here, the 2023 monthly earnings for the drivers last year fell 2.5% for Lyft and fell about 17% for Uber drivers. Gotti? NBC's Stephen Romo, thanks so much. And now to a science mystery that's got everyone talking, and it starts with a stingray ultrasound. Yeah. A pregnant stingray's ultrasound. That's what you're looking at, and it's because Charlotte, the stingray who lives in the North Carolina aquarium, well, she doesn't have an obvious baby daddy. You see, the aquarium doesn't have any male rays, and Charlotte hasn't shared a tank with one in over eight years, but she does share that tank with two young male sharks, and caretakers noticed that she was covered in bite marks, and apparently sharks get kind of rough when they, uh, when they mate. So Charlotte is due within the next two weeks. We should have some solid answers soon, but I can't wait for those solid answers. So who do I call? I call <laughs> Forrest Galante, a wildlife expert and biologist, and today, I guess, the stand-in for Mari Povich. Yeah, you got it. <laughs> <laughs> what is going on here? I mean, like, first of all, I was, I've was i been Googling a sure. lot, and I don't want to show the images, but from a mechanic standpoint, can, like, a... It is possible, yeah, it is. believe it or not, and especially with small benthic sharks. There are two small benthic male sharks in that aquarium. It is possible for copulation to take place, anatomically speaking. Anatomically speaking. Yes, okay. absolutely. And, and so does that mean that the sharks would come, like, because I'm looking at these pictures, and I've yep. actually seen you post videos of sharks doing it. I have. I have indeed. And it just <laughs> seems like a crazy, like, wrestling match. So yep. the stingray would be on the bottom? Yeah, so there would be this wrapping around sensation look, where there'd be... Uh, yeah, it's graphic. <laughs> um, the, the animal's bodies would become intertwined, and then uh, the male, which has a hemipene, actually two penises, would then insert into the female's cloaca, um, which is very graphic way of saying it's sort of this dance, it sounds gross, it's actually pretty beautiful, but I don't know if anybody's ever seen a stingray and a shark going at it, so that's this is a whole <laughs> different story we got. So... Do you, do you think that this is what happened? We're going to see this mutant, or do you think that something else is going on? Well, Gaudi, there's really three options here, okay. okay? So the first one is the one that we've just discussed, which is this crazy hybridization interspecies relationship. The second is something that uh, sharks raise and some reptiles are capable of doing, which is sperm retention. So if there was a male in with that female stingray some eight-plus years ago, believe it or not, if they had made it eight years ago, that female would be capable of retaining the sperm and putting out offspring eight years later, but it's highly, highly unlikely because that's a very, very long Yeah, expiration period. date on that sperm exactly. is uh, probably exactly. not eight years. Exactly. So what's the third option? So the third and I think most interesting option is a process called parthenogenesis. So parthenogenesis is 
an evolutionary adaptation that some creatures have developed to basically save the species. So when a female is isolated, a uh, female of a shark, a ray, some species of reptile are isolated with no males for long enough, something sort of triggers in their brain and goes, hey, we got to save the species. If I don't reproduce, the species is going to dry up and disappear. And parthenogenesis kicks in, which is basically a clone where the mother will produce a female clone offspring of herself in ho or several in some cases, in hopes of those offspring, which are perfectly fertile, going out and hopefully finding a mate to so mate. So like virgin birth, or, virgin or birth. If, if I remember Jurassic Park, like life finds a way. Finds a way, that's right, Dottie. <laughs> that's so wild. It's a fantastic so process. When we find out about the, like the birth is gonna happen, yep. and it's gonna pop out, and we will have conclusive answers then, but are we gonna be able to study the genome? Are we gonna learn about the genes? Yeah, we should be able to tell, I mean, if it were some sort of hybrid, it would be very, very clear immediately that this is something, looks like a guitar fish, something <laughs> halfway between a shark and a stingray. So I think we'll be able to rule that out very quickly. Whether it's parthenogenic or whether there's genetic diversity, we'll be able to tell by taking DNA and actually looking at the cellular structure of the animals. Oh my gosh, Forrest, I could talk to you about this all night and I love the shark shirt. <laughs> it seemed the guns, dude, thank you so much. We gotta go fishing soon. <laughs> Please, come up, Gotti, anytime. <laughs> Thanks so much. Uh, Forrest Galante, thanks so much. We've got a lot more ahead. Coming up in just a bit, we've got uh, still to come. A uh, man wanted for murder in Massachusetts was again arrested in Kenya a week after he escaped custody. That story and other big headlines trending around the world so next, so stay tuned. Hey there, welcome back. Let's take a quick look around the world. Today, Ukraine's military claims to have sunk a Russian ship with a drone, but Russian officials have yet to confirm that attack. Now, today's attack is the latest in a series of Ukrainian strikes on Moscow's Black Sea fleet. A man facing murder charges in Massachusetts has been arrested in Kenya. In fact, he was rearrested today. Kenyan police say the man was first arrested last week while awaiting extradition on Massachusetts warrant, but that he allegedly murdered his girlfriend and left her body in a car at Boston Logan's airport. He escaped, and now there's a suspicion that some Kenyan officials or officers were in on it. And North Korea fired multiple cruise missiles into the sea in its fifth test of weapons since January as part of a streak in weapons demonstrations. And experts say North Korea is ramping up pressure in an election year. And North Korean leader Kim Jong-un has been making statements threatening to annihilate South Korea with nuclear weapons if provoked, leaving elevated tensions in that whole area. And an alligator snapping turtle with the power to bite through bone was found in England last week, thousands of miles away from its native home in the United States. Dog walkers spotted that turtle in an English pond, rescued it, and took it to a vet north of London who named it Fluffy. It's still unclear how Fluffy ended up so far from home. Thankfully, he's gonna be rehomed to a specialist wildlife company out there in England. And the U.S. is launching an investigation into some of the airstrikes carried out by Israel in Gaza and Lebanon. And tonight, we are learning more about an American teenager killed out in the West Bank. NBC correspondent Molly Hunter has more from Jerusalem. Tonight, as Israel pushes further south in the Gaza Strip, ramping up its campaign against Hamas, the U.S. is now investigating Israeli airstrikes that have killed civilians, including the use of white phosphorus in Lebanon last October. The U.S. is reviewing the actions of its close ally as part of an effort to track how American weapons are being used. This comes as the conflict escalates tonight across the northern border. Israel striking back at Iranian-backed Hezbollah after an Israeli soldier was killed in a cross-border rocket attack. And tensions also high in the occupied West Bank. In the village of Bidou, wrapped in a Palestinian flag, the funeral procession for 17-year-old American Mohammed Kadur. <laughs> Don't be scared, his younger brother whispers. His family says their gentle, kind teen was shot and killed Saturday by an Israeli settler. One human rights group estimates nearly 100 Palestinian children have been shot by settlers or Israeli troops since October. A lot of people, they think the war and the killing in Gaza, but not. It's in West Bank, too. We met his parents, Ahmed and Hanan. Born in Florida, Mohammed was a senior in high school here. His 16-year-old cousin, Malik, was with him Saturday afternoon at a popular place for picnics. I heard gunshots, Malik says. Mohammed was shot twice in the head, 
the blood still on Malik's jacket. All our life has changed. We are not the same as before. <clears throat> Everything is different. U.S. officials visited the family earlier today. We're looking for justice. Do you think you'll get it? I hope so. We've asked about that incident. The Israeli military referred us to the domestic security services who have not responded for comment. And turning out to Los Angeles, where an abandoned skyscraper here covered in graffiti seems to not only be drawing vandals, but base jumpers from around the world. It's happening at this complex, once meant to be a luxury hotel in the heart of downtown L.A., and now it's being guarded around the clock with city leaders demanding the bankrupt owners be held financially responsible and a whole bunch of wild stuff is happening inside. Take a look. Jaw-dropping video shared on YouTube appears to show four people base jumping from these unfinished towers in downtown Los Angeles. What? The same buildings drawing global attention after they were tagged with nearly 30 floors worth of graffiti, an urgent warning from city officials. We do not want to see a tragedy take place, and I guarantee you a tragedy will take place there if that place is not boarded up quickly. On Friday, the L.A. City Council issued a deadline for the owner to secure and clean up the site, or else the city will and send them the bill. The owner of the building should be held accountable, and he should reimburse the city for every dime that is spent. The chief of police says his officers now surround the property around the clock, stretching already thin resources to their limits. At least 18 people have been arrested in connection to the vandalism and trespassing case, but police say only four are locals. Unfortunately, it has become an iconic location to draw uh, people for nefarious acts. Last month, NBC Los Angeles filmed two people with backpacks climbing through a hole in the fence, their news helicopter later catching vandals making their mark on the skyscraper. <laughs> it's nothing like this has happened in graffiti for quite some time. Pennsylvania graffiti artist John Grimm calling it a moment for the history books. It definitely is a crime. That's part of the reason why many people do graffiti in the first place is for that that thrill, that excitement, and there's only the excitement if it's a crime. Construction on the infamous Oceanwide Plaza was halted in 2019 when the Chinese developers say they ran out of money. NBC News reached out to the property owner, Oceanwide Holdings Incorporated, for comment. We had not heard back. A prime piece of real estate in the heart of downtown, once hoped to lure luxury tenants, now a haven for thrill seekers. There is a real and present danger to people inside that, that facility of falling to their death or otherwise suffering some type of serious injury or death. Kenny Griffin, thanks so much. Before we go, it is time for the future of everything. And if you've got trouble expressing your feelings, well, there is an AI tool for that. This Valentine's Day, we are taking a close look at some tech that's helping some people find some love. We'll be right back, so stay tuned. Welcome back now. Time for the future of everything. Microsoft says foreign hackers have been using tools from OpenAI to hone skills and trick their targets. Now, the company tracked hacking groups associated with Russia, Iran, North Korea, and China. Microsoft found that they were all using artificial intelligence, prompting a ban on state-backed hacking groups from using its AI products. And self-driving car company Waymo is recalling software that was used in its cars. Now, this is after two crashes in the Phoenix area involving a pickup truck towing a car. There are new concerns as it's the first ever recall for the Alphabet-owned company. Waymo says that software has been updated. And while self-driving cars are being taken off the road, one community in Arizona is getting rid of cars altogether. This is the first planned community in the country to go carless. And CNBC senior real estate correspondent Diana Olick has more on how it's impacting those who live there. This brand new rental community in Tempe has all the amenities, fitness center, dog park, outdoor kitchens, but something's missing. So there are no cars in this community at all. Isn't it great? Cul-de-sac is the first community in the U.S. designed and built specifically for car-free living. Co-founder yeah, Ryan Johnson says the demand is strong. Every generation 
and including 90% of Gen Z, would like to pay more to live in a walkable neighborhood. Retail, restaurants, and to start, nearly 200 apartments, all within steps of each other. No cars means no parking spaces, no garages. Because we don't have residential parking, it opens us up to have 55% landscape space. We get to add so much to the neighborhood. Like social spaces around every corner. The complex is strategically located right next to the area's light rail system. All residents get a free pass. The first 200 also get a free electric e-bike. And a partnership with Lyft gets them discount rides. I've been fine just going via rail or just biking. Juan Ramos, among the first 100 to move in here, grew up in Arizona, but left because he didn't like the car-dependent sprawl. At 27, he just came back and says living car-free has opened his eyes. Frankly, for most of the apartments I've lived in for years, I've never even talked to my neighbors. I know people, like, that's Pete over there, that's Ben over there, and I'm like, that's the first time I've said that. Residents often gather near the retail stores, which focus on small businesses. Jada Stratman is moving both her home sense business and herself in. It's not as like affordable out here as it was a few years ago, you know, and having that opportunity to, to live and work where you are and just have it as one, that's perfect. Walkable neighborhoods are all well and good when the weather's fine, but temperatures here in the summer can sit over 100 degrees for weeks at a time. And that'll be the real test to see if carless living can really go the distance. Fascinating. Now, dating apps, maybe they're not working out for you, right? Well, there is still hope for tech lovers out there because AI tools are entering the dating scene. Now, if you're like, no, absolutely not. Hard no, just, just listen to what they're offering. Personalized dating advice, even better matches based on what you like in the real world. I don't know, CNBC's Julia Borstein has more. The online dating market is expected to grow by more than two and a half times to hit nearly $24 billion by 2032. And new AI tools are a key part of that growth. One startup, Mino, is an AI chatbot that offers customized relationship advice with funding from VC firm Sequoia. The CEO who previously ran Tinder said that this is part of a new category of relationship tools, helping their users figure out how to express their feelings or set boundaries. You know, it's nothing like the movie Her. It's not a fake girlfriend. It's not trying to be a therapist even. Um, it's more like the Ra Remy and Ratatouille, which is, uh, you know, instead of helping you make incredible soup, it's teaching you all about having great relationships. Another chatbot called Blush from a Kosla Venture-backed AI company called Replica looks like a fake girlfriend or boyfriend. It invites users to interact on a Tinder-like platform with virtual characters, which it says aims to teach people how to practice flirting and communication. Now, it's not just startups investing in AI. The public dating giants Match and Bumble are using AI to bolster their business and protect their users. Match says it's using AI to upgrade its ability to make matches, to improve users' experience setting up their profile and picking photos, and for post-match prompts, like suggesting date ideas based on users' interests. Bumble uses AI in its deception detector to identify spam, scam, and fake profiles, reducing reports of them by 45%. It also offers users AI-powered icebreakers, which are customized based on their profiles. Now, AI dating tools aren't about curing loneliness with a virtual significant other, but rather about deploying learnings from data in order to get people to meet up in person faster. Julia Borston, CNBC Business News, Los Angeles. And finally, what's your idea of a perfect Valentine's Day? For a lot of people, love definitely costs a thing or two. Just ask our friends over at Dunder Mifflin. My perfect Valentine's Day? I'm at home, three cell phones in front of me, fielding desperate calls from people who want to buy one of the 50 restaurant reservations I made over six months ago. Flowers, diamonds, three-course meal, violinist comes to my table to serenade me. Pizza, soda, the moon, someone to share it with. And I'll be one of those suckers calling Dwight there. This Valentine's Day, people are expected to spend a record amount of money to make the day of love extra special. We are talking flowers, candy, maybe a fancy dinner. NBC News business and data correspondent Brian Chung joins us now to break things down for us. Uh, Brian, thanks so much for joining us on a Valentine's. We're kind of Valentine's with each other because, you know, we're hanging out on it. a Valentine night. 
Sounds great. Um, so question one here, it feels like everything is getting more expensive. Usually we blame inflation, but is Valentine's Day included here? How much are people expected to spend? Well, they're expected to spend a pretty penny. In fact, it was JLo, I think, that said, my love don't cost a thing, but it does. And I'll tell you exactly how much it costs. It costs $14.2 billion. That, by the way, is the estimate from the National Retail Federation on how much is going to be spent on Valentine's Day. If that happens, that would be a record. Now, of course, the usual suspects in terms of what they will be buying on this holiday, 57% will buy candy. Obviously, chocolate's big on this holiday. But, of course, you got to think about the bling and the flowers, 6.5%. $4 billion on jewelry, $2.6 billion on flowers. And by the way, I didn't even cover the cost of those cards, which, by the way, 145 million cards will be exchanged. That, according to a Hallmark, and those are pretty expensive. I've seen like six, seven dollar cards these days. It's like, what is going on out here, Gotti? Yeah, and then sometimes the envelopes aren't even there. And you're like, wait, I, I, the yes, envelopes are all gone yes. here. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Are there some big changes in how people are celebrating today, or is it is mostly chocolate and flowers? Yeah, well, I mean, look, the classics are going to be in place in addition to, obviously, jewelry and flowers. We also have to talk about what people are doing for the evening when it comes to some of those dinner plans. So $4.9 billion is the estimated spend on Valentine's Day date night. 32% of Americans are planning a night out. That's actually lower than what I thought. A lot of people may be planning on just staying inside. Uh, but for those that have reservations, 30% of Valentine's dinner reservations are according to Resi, interesting, made within the last 24 hours. So a lot of uh, kind of late planners there. And by the way, the spend is going to be about $203, so uh, pretty expensive, which brings me back to that Dwight clip, Gotti. I mean, that's a pretty good <laughs> right, business exactly. model, in my opinion. I think yeah, as a business guy, absolutely. I can say that's a good model. Three cell phones? More like like 50 cell yeah, phones. Exactly. Uh, I, don't, I, I don't know about your love life these days, but I do know about your obvious uh, love of numbers here. So I got to ask, oh, what are the numbers these days when it comes to relationships? Yeah, I, I see what you're doing. I'm not going to bite on the first part of that question, but I'll bite <laughs> on the second part of that question. Let me give you some stats in terms of modern dating, obviously, with uh, just these apps that are so prevalent these days. Interesting to see that 17% of marriages begin online. That, according to a recent survey, very prevalent. Uh, Tinder, uh, the most popular app, of course, 340 million app downloads. That is internationally, because that would be about the size of the U.S. population. That is since its creation uh, over 10 years ago. Uh, and by the way, when we talk about dating, right, we also have to talk about the profile of what people want to see in their significant other. 60%, according to a recent survey, get the ick from bad spending. In fact, they say it's worse than having bad breath. So, Bad finance is not necessarily great, but at the end of the day, look, it's Valentine's Day, a wonderful holiday to propose, and 9 million proposals on Valentine's Day, uh, that according to some recent stats as well. So a lot of people popping the question on what is probably the most romantic day of the year, Gotti. Brian Chung, some people wear their heart on their sleeves. You're wearing it on your cardigan there. Thank you so much for joining us, brother. Yeah. And that does it for us tonight. Happy Valentine's Day. I'm Gotti Schwartz. We'll see you tomorrow, but until then, stay tuned now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.